Uh, thank you. Um, before I even get started on what I wrote that I wanted to say to you tonight, uh, I wanted to follow up on one of the comments uh, that uh, uh, Janice uh, had made. Um, one of the things that I've done over the years is I've uh, helped to uh, run a program during the summer called uh, the Summer Transition Program. And as you may appreciate, it's for students who are transitioning from secondary into post-secondary. And she reminded me of one of the items that a parent um, said to us uh, at one of those sessions over the years, and it's been repeated in other forms uh, many times since then. And it had to do with the concept of reduced load. Now, I don't know how many of you know anything about reduced load, but get to know it. It can be one of the biggest gifts you can give to yourself if you're a student with ASD going or, or with learning differences, difficulties going into post-secondary. Or as parents, you can give to your children or as practitioners out there that you can convince those kids and parents who, well, we don't want to take longer than it needs to, take reduced load. It helps, it works, it makes it possible. Um, that's the message from parents who've been there before and who didn't quite necessarily understand it, but who came back to us you know, a year, year or two later and said, wow, do we ever understand now why you spent so much time talking about reduced load? So having said that, uh, thinking positively about the future. Um, as uh, Judy mentioned to you, uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, do a sabbatical year where I did look into um, what was happening at institutions, organizations um, uh, across uh, uh, Canada and um, large parts of the United States, uh, researching issues, current practices, and solutions at post-secondary for students experiencing high-functioning autism and Asperger's. Now, I could go into all of the issues, the problems, and there are many, um, but as we are here tonight thinking positive about the future, uh, I'd rather go through the positive things that are currently happening in institutions um, abroad and here, and the solutions that you, uh, individuals on the spectrum, or those who are helping those individuals on the spectrum, can look to pursuing, uh, and uh, look to your institutions to provide for you in the future. Um, if you really want to read over a hundred pages of stuff that I wrote on this, you can. Um, you know, I've got my cards over there. You can email me. I'll send you um, copies of my sabbatical report. Um, I'll send you um, my 24 point plus plan uh, for colleges and universities that uh, can enable them to meet the needs of students experiencing ASD. So uh, if you want that, please, you know, take my email address, send me, and I will send it to you. Um, you know, it can help inform discussions that you may have in the future with um, politicians, institutions, or support personnel. As for the positive, what is available now? Now, when I came here tonight, knowing that the good folks at CIP, College Internship Program, were sponsoring this, I really expected that they were going to tell you a whole lot more about what they do. Because in my travels, in my you know, investigation, I discovered this program, uh, the CIP program, does a lot of really great stuff. Uh, so, you know, I said, I've got written here, as you've already heard. But, you know, you haven't really. So I've got to take a few minutes to say at least my impression of what it is that they do. They have a, I, I call it a gold standard program when it comes to services and supports for students on the spectrum. Uh, and I know they work with some other students as well, but that's what I'm talking about. That's where my interest lies. Uh, you know, my little thing here says parent and professional. And so this is something that's very close for me, very, very close. Um, and when I see something that's as good as what they do, where they're looking to the emotional well-being, they're looking to uh, those struggles, and they are struggles, in separation and independence, uh, those um, you know, liaising with those support people at 
the colleges and universities where their program is located in the various places they are located, you know, uh, the living skills, the dealing with the anxiety, which is pervasive, the uh, sensory issues, you know, and on and on. They have this all-encompassing wraparound program. Um, I just wish it were free. <laughs> uh, but you can talk to them about that. Uh, it really is a fantastic program. There are other equally exciting programs out there. Uh, there is another, and again, I put it in that gold standard kind of program, you know, and by that I mean really one that we should, as with the CIP, we should be studying it, we should be learning from it, we should be emulating those things that they do so well in our own programs. Um, this other one, uh, also, as I said, a gold standard program, uh, in my opinion, uh, is uh, Landmark College in uh, Putney, Vermont. Um, they have a slightly different kind of approach. They are a college and they are a degree granting institution. Um, but what they do is they ensure that every member of their staff is fully cognizant of what are the neuropsychological implications of the disabilities that they work with. And they work with ASD, ADHD, and learning disabilities. They also make sure on top of this, because it's all very well to know about the disability, they make sure that their staff are fully trained in universal instructional design. So what is that? Well, that's the, you know, instead of um, coming along later and having the uh, DSO office, the Disability Support Office, tell you you need to put a ramp in because we've got some people who are using chairs who are, you know, going to be attending our institution, you build all the ramps up front. And in that, you know, metaphorical sense, these professors know how to organize their courses and their classes so that the ramps are built in. That's universal instructional design. Now, it doesn't mean that every need is taken care of, but when you take the professors who know the disabilities and what is required to help that individual have a chance of being successful or of failing, that can happen too, but have a chance of doing that on an equal basis. When you take those professors and then pair it with the students who are also taught how to understand their disability, they're able to work out almost everything on their own between the two of them in terms of how am I gonna learn in your class. Um, I visited uh, Landmark uh, in March of uh, my sabbatical year and up to March of that year, there had been one student who felt that they hadn't quite gotten their needs met. Now, I don't know how many students, you know, your DSO office is seeing at your institution, but at Landmark, they don't have a DSO. There is no disability supports office because it's built in. And, um, you know, that's, that's another one of these programs to look to for how can we emulate those kind of supports within our own institutions here in Canada. Um, there are other programs uh, throughout the US, um, notable uh, Marshall University. Um, I don't know if you remember the movie, We Are Marshall. Um, and that um, is another example of a kind of program, a little bit like the CIP program, in that it's a, a support service you pay extra for this service and you know it's kind of like CIP ultra light you know that's that's kind of uh, perhaps the approach that you might call it but um, it's integrated though into the actual academic institution but it's additional it's something that people pay more for in order to uh, to access it um, one of the other points around any of these programs that you know, I've, I've seen that have been successful is they have, and this includes Landmark, 
they have people, you can call them counselors, you can call them support workers, you can call them anything you want. They have people who are immediately available to meet the needs of that student when they have a problem. It's not come to the office, make an appointment, we can see you in two weeks. It's, and this was explained to me by one student at Landmark as, uh, you know, he was saying, oh, you remember when we had the floods? And I don't know, they had floods in Vermont, I guess, okay, fine. And uh, well, you know, it, that night, I was having a problem. And I didn't know this, but I called my counselor at home that night, and he talked to me for an hour on the phone. And he got me through that problem I was having, and he got me calmed down. And, you know, as, uh, um, well, I don't know if it's just the folks at Landmark, but as many people talk about, he, he got me through my amygdala hijacking. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but he was standing two feet deep in water in his house as he talked to me. <laughs> so that's the kind of supports that you just dream about for, you know, your son, daughter, yourself, if, you know, you're, you're on the spectrum and looking to, to go into post-secondary. And that's the kind of support you get at these gold standard programs. I don't know if the folks at CIP have stood knee-deep in water yet, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so, uh, we're not alone. I mean, we are not without our own very successful, very good programs here in Canada. Um, some of you may be uh, familiar with the York University program. Um, through, um, you know, a really wonderful combination of resources, uh, there's a lab run by uh, Jim Bebko, uh, Professor Jim Bebko at uh, York, which teaches people about autism. They're teaching their graduate students about autism. They're learning about autism. And they came up with the wonderful idea of, well, you know, we could mentor students in autism. So they went ahead and they developed that program. And following from that, the Disability Services Office at York is also offering um, um, a day for students with autism, and then they can perhaps even go on from that to spend time in the Learning Disabilities Program, which is four weeks in the summer, transition program. Uh, there are other programs, Seneca, uh, where I hail from, has a four-day but overnight uh, transition program for learning disabilities, and this year for the first time, we'll be offering a one-day uh, opportunity for students with ASD who then may go on to that learning disability program. I got my two-minute warning, so I'm rushing through a little bit because I've got pages here. Uh, but the, um, the point I'm trying to make is, and I'm going to go to that, is that a lot of these services, whether they're at Humber, uh, George Brown, at Centennial, at Algonquin, wherever they are. I had a wonderful experience at Centennial with a bunch of faculty earlier this week. They are so pumped to work with students with ASD. It was fantastic. But a lot of those programs are kind of piggybacking on funding that was put in place by the Harris Eves government for students with learning disabilities. Separate funding for students with ASD isn't there. Now you can, you know, you can take something like, and I've left my brochures out there on the peers program, the children's friendship training. You can do something like that. And because it's a therapeutic program, you can, you know, write it off on your taxes. You can get your insurance company to pay for it, whatever. But the stuff at post-secondary isn't funded. You know, that's something you're not going to get special needs services at home to pay for those services. And we have the opportunity now for our students to make it through secondary school. As you've heard from some of the people previously, um, there are, and you're going to hear more, there are some really good programs out there in the schools that are helping students to be successful now in the elementary and secondary schools. They're hitting post-secondary, and we don't have that targeted funding for targeted programs for them. Now, you know, our current premier, when she was, you know, not a premier, she got together various ministries and found that money to make those programs available in the schools. 
So, you know, I got my fingers crossed and I'm knocking on wood that she gets it. She knows what your students, what you as a person with ASD need in education. And that I'm hopeful, very hopeful. I've heard some very hopeful things tonight from a uh, gentleman who's here tonight, Mr. Conway, that these kind of things are going to go ahead. My time is up. Uh, so, advocacy. You've got to, yes, look at these good things that are happening. There are social groups, there's, you know, peers training, there's uh, these ASD transition days and or even weeks in some cases at some institutions. Some of our institutions in Ontario do not have any targeted services for students with ASD. Zero. You have to do your due diligence. You have to get out there a year or two before you're looking to get into that program and make sure not only is it the, you know, engineering or computer studies or whatever program that you're interested in, but they've got the supports in place as well. And, you know, as I said here somewhere, um, well, I don't know where I said it, but if the supports aren't there, how do you think the students are going to be successful? And I'm saying that to you as a student with ASD, I'm saying it to the parents, and I'm saying it to the support people who are here. If the supports are not in your institution, then how do you think the students are going to be successful? So, yes, be positive about the future. Look forward to the good programs that are out there, the things that we can learn from, the gold standard programs that are out there. But you've got to be prepared to gird yourselves and push a little bit to make sure that those things are going to be there at the place you need to go to do the program you want to do. Thank you.